Happy Sunday. I'm happy that uh, we are here to worship God despite the fact that this is the second day of Chinese New Year. Uh, I was asked why we didn't combine the two services in the afternoon to the morning. My answer was that we will do that when it is a purpose for the church, for example, a gospel rally or Christmas kind of a thing. But we would not combine out of our own convenience, meaning like a Chinese New Year's festival, and you combine it because of the convenience of the people, so as to make sure that we do not send the wrong signal out there, that our convenience dictate the way we worship God. So in the afternoon at 2.30, even if there will be one person, I will still be here to conduct the worship service because it's important that we honor God at the right time uh, during worship service. This is a, such an important thing for us to recognize. And uh, this evening, uh, Dr. Tong is not coming, so I don't have to wear a coat. Therefore, I'm wearing a Batik shirt that he gave me. So it's uh, I I always think the Batik shirt is so so clever, right? Once you go in a long sleeve, all of a sudden you become formal. And if it is short sleeve, then it's not formal. Quite a convenient way to 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 just uh, put on something. And it also calls to mind that there are differences in culture everywhere. And in today's sermon, I will touch a little bit on that, uh, kind of comparing different cultural aspects and the way it influences our theology and the way we look forward. I mean, for example, the Chinese culture. So earlier, some of you came to greet me and you do your Chinese gong si fa chai thing and then followed by, I really don't know what that means <laughs> because, uh, of course, a lot of you are Indonesian Chinese. You don't know your Mandarin very well. Uh, culturally, we are in the position as Christian people, especially for the Reformed Evangelical, to stand at a position where we critic culture. This is the thing that our senior pastor has taught us, and we need to have a lot of wisdom in doing that. So we do not reject culture the way some very conservative churches would. Some conservative churches would not encourage their members to celebrate Chinese New Year, for example. So you can forget about Ang Pao. Eh? So those are off, because those have pagan roots, right? Uh, the, the, the red color and what have you. But from the Reformed Evangelical position, we believe that God has enabled us to look at the world as the way he wanted us to, acknowledging that in a fallen world there are cultural aspects as well. And the culture comes together and we appreciate the way different cultures bring about the creativity that God has given to us. But at the same time, you don't fall into it. And as we become more and more well-versed with the Bible, we understand this very well and we can handle them very well. If not, you fall one way or the other. For example, in the Chinese greetings and what have you. Uh, when we understand the Bible better, we will be able to segregate it better. For example, I don't use the word gong si fa cai for Chinese because gong si means to sort of congratulate or to, to, to bless. But fa cai is a different thing. Fa cai means prosperity as far as wealth is concerned. Uh, and that's not a very Christian understanding. And so, Earlier, someone said Kung Si Fa Chai to me. I say, well, pastor, don't Fa Chai, la, basically. So it's okay. So the, 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 the word that people always use is Sing Nian Jing Pu, which is a kind of idea that you always improve with the Chinese New Year. Or, qing, or in Christian churches, Chinese-speaking churches, they always use Sing Nian Mong En, which means that in the Chinese New Year, may you be blessed. Uh, even that, from a theological angle, is a little bit strange because we are already blessed. So sometimes when you, you are very careful and when you understand the Bible better, it even changes the words you use. Uh, you have been listening to my preaching or been reading some of the things I write. You may notice that there are some words I do not use. I do not use the word unfortunately. I use the word unhappily. Because unfortunately means the word fortune is involved. It means that there is an element of luck in whatever it is that we are doing. Uh, or I do not use the word hopefully. I use the word prayerfully. Because hopefully, again, this is a sense of unknown, right? You, you hope that something happens. So as we progress in faith, we will be able to segregate uh, and be a little bit more sensitive about this. Don't want to be legalistic about it, but it is true that we will see it as we progress. And so it is with the preaching today. We are again touching on the continuation of the chapter on 1 Corinthians 15, the chap great, great chapter on the resurrection. This is our third session on it. So while the whole chapter is quite simple and straightforward as a chapter on the resurrection, again, other than the main theme of resurrection, there are many interesting side lessons that we can learn. And today, in, in particular, we will be looking at some of the cultural comparison between 
the idea of life after life between Christianity and all other faiths. So let's review what was taught last week. Last week's lesson was a bit uh, odd in its title. I entitled the lesson The Tortoise and the Door Seal after a Chinese idiom, Wu Kui Kuo Men Kan, The Tortoise and the Door Seal. How a tortoise will attempt to go over a door seal. A door seal is a piece of wood that is at the bottom of a door in uh, Chinese architectural design. Uh, it was a, a passage where the Apostle Paul continued to argue for the resurrection and its implication to us all. I want to remind you again, as I did two lessons ago, the Bible talks about of first important in verse 3. What is the most important thing to us? The whole of the chapter in chapter 15 tells us that of first importance is the recognition that number one, Jesus Christ died for your sin. Number two, he was buried. Number three, God raised him from the dead. And if that were not the case, the Apostle Paul declared, everything is in vain. Everything is a waste of time. Everything is meaningless. So if you focus on what's the most important gospel message, the most important gospel message actually is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And But it's a very difficult thing to believe in. So I, I went ahead last week to explain to you that there are many skeptics out there Back in the days of Jesus Christ, so many people really don't get it and they don't believe in it. Uh, till today, it's the same thing. Uh, I am quite certain that as I speak to you, the vast majority of you will not be thinking about the resurrection as a reality. Most of you will be thinking of it as, well, it's a biblical teaching. You, you don't even think about death. And, uh, and this is the second day of Chinese New Year. Here you have a pastor talking about death. If you think that you're going to be swayed because of that, uh, let me tell you that you are believing in the wrong faith, uh, the wrong religion. Again, as, we are, as far as we are concerned, we are people who are above culture. So it's all right for us to, to think about the reality of life. And that's what the Apostle Paul was telling us about. And remember that his argument about the resurrection, number one, is historical not theological, not philosophical. The first argument that the Apostle Paul had for the resurrection is a historical one. And he mentioned names of people who saw Jesus Christ, the 500 who witnessed his resurrection. And he challenged the people, if you don't believe me, go look for them. Go talk to them. They are, some of them are dead, but many are still alive. So Paul said, go look for them. So remember always that the resurrection is a historical fact, not a philosophical argument alone. And then he went on to list out some of the consequences that will happen if we ignore the resurrection. Many different things. Number one, it means that all preachers are lying because all preachers preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, it means that Jesus Christ remained dead. And if Jesus Christ remained dead, the dominoes start to fall one after another. It means we remain dead in sin. It means all has no hope. From ourselves to all the great saints of the past, all your missionaries of the past, everybody who works so hard for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody is dead in sin. And finally, we are most to be pitied. The last one came about because of the difficulties that Christians had to go through back in the days of the Church of Corinth, where people were persecuted, they were thrown to the lions, they were burned into the stake, all because they proclaimed themselves to be Christian. And so the Apostle Paul said, you did all these things for nothing because if death ends all things, then poor thing, you guys got fooled into thinking that there are more to life and then you're willing to give your life to Jesus Christ. And I reminded you last week that this was not the case for the Church of Corinth. It's still the case today, right? As I speak, many people in the Middle Eastern region are being persecuted because they are Christians. Uh, there's a Facebook thing that's going on asking people to pray for Christians in the Middle East because they are made to put a sign on top of their door, the letter N in Arabic, which stands for Nazarene, which means Jesus the Nazarene, meaning that this household is a Christian household. And, and once you are forced to put a sign on your door, it means that you're up for persecution. All kinds of nonsense will happen to you. And just in case you think that this is a recent phenomenon, it's not. Even when I was a teenager, I've been reading about persecution in the Middle East uh, among for the Christians because there are many extreme uh, Islamic kind of understanding which says that it is all right to go and rob, to burn, to rape, to, to, to just plunder the house of the infidels, which are the non-Muslims. So there are many people who actually believe in that sort of thing. So till today, persecution is still the case. So if Jesus Christ was not resurrected and there's no resurrection for his believers, 
then too bad to all of you who have spent all your life struggling. And so Paul said, you are most to be pitied. And then he went on to explain in theological term, why the resurrected matter. There are two Adam. The first Adam led all of us to death. And then the second Adam, or the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, led us to life. And, and then came the wonderful proclamation of the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ. You know, every time I read verses like that, I, I think that we far, far underestimate our faith and the reality of what it's all about. And, and many times Christians live a life that is uh, not exactly victorious, right? I mean, sometimes we struggle with life and, and what have you. We, we don't quite get it, you know. That's why it's important for us to return to the Bible. The Bible proclaims that the Lord we follow will ultimately be victorious. And the victory is an absolute one, an ultimate, absolute, no question asked kind of victory over all the earth. And that's the Lord that we follow. And not only that, the Apostle Paul declared death is the ultimate and final victim, uh, vic enemy to be defeated. And that's in relation to us because we all face death, every single one of us. Remember I told you last week, 100 years from now, every single one of you will be dead, including me. 100 years from now. Because that's the reality of us all. But with Jesus Christ, we are now brought into another promise. And I ended the sermon Back to the title, the tortoise and the door seal. Strange title for the sermon. The tortoise and the door seal is a Chinese idiom, which means it's either here or there. Because when a tortoise tries to cross a door seal, it either flip one side or flip the other side. It's not possible for a tortoise to flip, stand in the middle ground. To remind us that when the Apostle Paul wrote about the resurrection and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the attitude and the intention behind is this either here or there kind of a philosophy or understanding that the gospel of Jesus Christ is either real or it's not. You're either committed or you're not. You, you really follow Jesus Christ or you're not. And in today's preaching, you see the same spirit being carried on in the next portion of 1 Corinthians 15. So as we approach the verse, let's come to the Lord in a word of prayer and commit the time into his almighty hands. We thank you, O God, for calling all of us here this morning. We do want to ask that you help us to focus on you, whoever we may be. However successful we may think our life turned out to be, or however miserable we think we are, however a, much a failure we think we are, or however proud we think our life should be, when we come before you, let us all be humble and be like a little child before his heavenly Father. Because indeed, you are the giver of life, the creator of all heavens and earth. And we are but your creature, your creation. We ask, O oh God, for this humility. For the Bible tells us that God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. Let us open up our ears to hear your word and recognize it, that it may come into our life and transform us that we may live a life that glorify you and where we enjoy you forevermore. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's carry on with the passage that the Apostle Paul has written and he went on to explain further reinforcing some of his earlier points about the resurrection. But verse 29 started off a bit odd. How, what, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? So this is considered one of the more difficult uh, verse in the Bible because we don't quite know what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said people are being baptized for the dead. It probably referred to a custom back in the early church of Corinth, where there are people who die first and didn't get baptized. And so there must be some kind of a custom where they practice people volunteering to be baptized on behalf of the dead. So Paul used that as an example to say that, well, you believe in such things. So if you do that kind of a ritual, it means that you must believe in life after death. And so if that were the case, why do you then argue that there is no resurrection? So that's probably what this verse really means. So I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but remember that the Bible has some verses relating to the context of the time in which we have very little clue about, but it's not considered a major problem. 
And then Paul then bring the illustration to himself. Remember the earlier verses is all the argument for the resurrection of the dead. Paul says that if the dead is not resurrected, then all of you are struggling for nothing. Now he brings the attention to himself in verse 30. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. So the Apostle Paul, as you read other portions of the Bible, you will know that he really led a very terrible and difficult life. You know, sometimes when we look at cultural depiction of the apostles and of Jesus Christ and things like that, we get the illusion that they were very nice people and very clean and very healthy kind of thing, right? I mean, you look at all the medieval thing; they always have a glow in their head, kind of aura surrounding them, and especially on our Lord Jesus Christ. Very clean and very handsome. Uh, you know, his hair is like, he has gone to some saloon or something, very shiny and all that. But the reality must not be so, right? Remember, Jesus Christ was a carpenter. He lived in the wilderness. He slept in the wilderness, uh, Shepherds, for example, in a, in a typical painting of a manger, the shepherds were calm, they are all very clean, very nice. Not so, you know, the real shepherds on the field must really, really smell the sheep. So the present Pope Francis has a very famous quotation. He said that if you want to be shepherd of the flock, you better smell like the sheep. Meaning that pastors better not be clean and uh, very smells like, I don't know, Chanel number five or whatever. You can't. You, you need to be on the ground to be with the sheep. You need to smell. You need to be like them. So it must be the same for the Apostle Paul as well. The Bible tells us by Paul's own writing that he struggled like crazy. He was hungry. He was bitten. He suffered every day. So this is kind of an expression. He was in danger all the time. Verse 32, What do I gain if humanly speaking I fought with beasts at Ephesus? Again, this is something contextually we don't quite know what he meant. Uh, because there's no other description in the Bible, but we acknowledge that he had a lot of difficulties in his life. If the dead were not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So again, the Apostle Paul is saying that, hey, look here, I suffer like crazy for this gospel because the resurrection is real. If it is not real, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This is a, a Greek quotation that Paul used, but I think every culture has similar kind of a quotation, right? In the modern, modern day context, uh, people print things like, life is a bitch and then you die. B-E-A-C-H, uh, by the way, <laughs> and then you die. Or YOLO, you only have one life to live, so do whatever you want. And so I was preaching about this last week, right? When we talk about the dot tortoise and the door seal, I was challenging you last week that you either be committed to Jesus Christ or you are not. And if you are not committed to Jesus Christ, then go live a hedonistic lifestyle. Live life any way you want, just like this. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow. We die. And I don't know whether you remember this. I hope you don't remember this. But last week, the, the, the kind of quotation I gave to you is, if you don't want to be a Christian, then go do whatever you want. Just, just what? Well, you know, you, you guys remember things like that very well. <laughs> but you don't remember the Bible verse so well. Do whatever you want, just don't get caught. That's a, that's a tremendous quotation. I should patent this. But I, I, I learned it from the army, by the way. Do whatever you want, just don't get caught. I thought that's a, wow, quite a marvelous way to think about life, right? Exactly as the Apostle Paul says, if there's no resurrection, if there's no God, if there's no life after your present life, then yeah, do whatever you want, just don't get caught. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow. We die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good moral. This again is another Greek quotation, meaning that the early church in the church of Corinth, they had so many people who are from different groups, a pagan background. They're coming together and influence the people of God. And the Apostle Paul says, bad company ruins Good moral. I think in Chinese idiom, there's always a, a, the, the saying as well. If you get close to a black ink, you become black. If you get close to red ink, you become red. Jing zhu zhe zhe, jing mo zhe hei. There's the same kind of a general common understanding was applied to the church in Corinth as well. And then a, a strong statement of rebuke. Wake up! 
Wake up from your drunkard stumper, as it is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, say, and I say this to your shame. So the Apostle Paul then strongly rebuked the people to stop messing around with all this crazy pagan teaching about life being whatever it is, instead of the resurrection. So you got to wake up. And then for the next subsequent verses, the Apostle Paul went into fine detail as to what the resurrection is really all about. Now before that, I mentioned earlier, I thought it is important for us to think also about what other people say about the resurrection, especially for all of us who live in a multiracial, multicultural kind of society, because it will shape the way we think about this as well. So last week, we actually started off thinking about death and life after death from various angles, one of which is the most simplest idea that life ends the way you blow up a candle. In Chinese, this is when you die, it is as if a candle is blown out. Now this, I suppose, is one of the more prevalent ideas that many people have relating to death. That what happened to you when you die? Many people believe that when you die, is you die. I think our, uh, our senior uh, minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said quite many times that he do believe that when you die, you die, and everything ends, like you blow up and extinguish a candle. For many people who are atheists and they don't believe in God or doesn't quite know who God is or whatever, this seems to be the way life should be like. And many people argue that when you die, everything should end. And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to instill that kind of idea. But there is one big problem with the philosophy that when you die, everything ends. And that big problem is you. Meaning you will not accept it. You will not take it. You will not be convinced of it completely. And I'm talking about you as with anybody else. I mean, you can be Muslim, Buddhist, or even atheist. The fact is that something inside of us tells us that that is not the case. That there is something beyond this. And this is an instinctive understanding of every single living human being. Especially when you read Romans chapter 1, the Bible tells us that whatever is known of God is already placed in you. Now, one of the clearest examples that I always cite is historically the example of China and the Soviet Union. So let's say that you believe that death ends with the blowing of the candle and there is no life after life. And that all these people who believe in life after death are all misguided. They are all superstitious, they are all people who are not scientific. And so we want to make sure that everybody becomes scientific. So what do we do? We go train our children from the time they are young to understand that there's really no God. That the best way to figure all things out is through the scientific method. The other day I just saw on a Facebook post posting, some guy put a posting there, that if a quotation from someone, I can't remember the name of that person, this person said that if we bring up a child without religious knowledge, Without religious knowledge, that means don't bring your kid to Sunday school. Don't, don't bring your kid. Don't tell your kid that there's a God. Don't tell your kid to pray or whatever. Do not influence your children in anything relating to God until the time the child reaches the age of reasoning. That means until your child is, is old enough to reason and think for himself, then you tell the child that there's a God, there's no God. The world will be a very different place. Now, this person means that the world will be a better place. Because, you know, if you go and from young, you teach the child to sing song and whatever it is, and our toddler's ministry, right, all the kids are singing songs. Um, and just as a sideline, we, we, we had a discussion among our Sunday school teachers, and some Sunday school teachers are a little bit uh, upset because they teach the toddlers and they say that, you know, the toddlers don't seem to uh, understand very much. They sing whatever it is, sing, 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 but they don't seem to have any spiritual growth. So they, some of our Sunday school teachers are a bit impatient, you know. They say, how do we know whether they learn anything? I say, come on, they are toddlers. <laughs> you teach them and you want to trust that God will use whatever you have taught them in God's own way. Don't go and look for KPIs or whatever when you teach Sunday school and toddlers and, and, and what have you. And I trust that God will use whatever we teach 
the children. You know, remember I always give you the example of of the big gangster pastor Neville Tan, who really got converted when he was in the prison when he remembered a song that his Sunday school teacher taught him when he was very young. I'm not saying our kids will be gangsters, but <laughs> but God will use it the way. Uh, God would. Now, so if you think that all we do is to teach the child knowledge of science and what have you, they will be enlightened. They will, it will be a better society because there's just no God. I have news for you. The Chinese and the Soviet Union have tried it for at least two generations when the Communist Party was in power. From cradle to grave, once you are born, kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, high school, university, postgrad. The entire education system from beginning to the end, no God. Science is the answer to everything. The, 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 the best proof of truth is verification, the pure scientific method. And both countries prove beyond all doubt that the key problem is you. The key problem is humankind. That you can go from cradle to grave and teach two generations of people that there is no God, that life ends, when you brought the candle, but people still believe. So today, China has the fastest growing Christian population in the entire world. Fastest growing. And that makes our senior pastor pretty excited because, you know, he, he, he is the biggest voice, you know. Just in case you all don't know, don't play, play. Uh. This senior pastor is very important for all of China. It's, it's crazy, you know. I went to, to Henan one time and, 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 uh, and went to... to preach in one of those uh, home church, home cell church that is uh, kind of illegal. So I had to follow this guy who is on a motorbike and then our car was behind it. Motorbike turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right and he's like, trying to shake off some kind of secret service or whatever and finally reach a farmer's home and it's like packed full of people. Like we were in the middle of nowhere, okay? In the middle of farmland, in the middle of nowhere and everybody know, what well, this is Tang Chong Rong's Fan Yi Yen Kam Wei Di. This is Stephen Tong's translator. It's crazy, you know, I was at Qing, no, Shanghai one time. I was walking along the street and someone stopped me and said, you are Tang Tong Rong Fan Yi. And I said, wow, I really cannot dig my nose in public nowadays because you are recognized. And so Dr. Tong, strong influence on China. And to think about it, you know, two generations of people thought that life ends like that. And it doesn't work. Why? Because you are created in God's image and likeness. You cannot shake from that. And of course, the bigger problem is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not preached and not reached to many people. And so instinctively, you know that there is life after death. And so to some extent, the natural laws of life dictate that we do not fool around in life, whether you're in a communist, atheistic China or anywhere else. You hear people talk about how instinctively they think that there's right and wrong. That this whole idea of do whatever you want, just don't get caught, may sound logical, but there's something in me that tells me that there's bigger things. So even in atheistic China, I've met many people who have a heart for good. And I find it most amazing that by common grace of God, there are people who want to help the poor in the middle of China nowhere, where it doesn't mean anything from a logical standpoint because they are not Christian or they don't believe in God. But it's instinctive to you. But the end result of not being guided means that there are many variations of understanding. That by your own imagination, you know that there's something out there. But what is that out there? What does that mean? And then you come up with a lot of variation. And there are many, many variations of life without Jesus Christ. Many people come up with many different understandings. What, that, what is most relevant to us in this society, and I think all of you are Chinese, maybe one exception or two, are the more Chinese-influenced cultural expression as to what life is all about. And I want to share a little bit of that to you. Uh, some people protest and say, hey, this pastor don't always talk about Jesus Christ. <laughs> some of the things we need to know so that when we talk to our friends and we understand where our friends and our loved ones are coming from, we get a proper understanding of the historical background and the context of this. Now, without the guidance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, many people in this society, in the Chinese society, are very much influenced by the concept of reincarnation, of how life moves round and round and round and round in a cycle. This is the most prevalent concept in our society. 
or any Chinese-based society. And when I use the words like that, I am talking about massive, complicated influence behind it in Taoism, Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all mixed together. Now, a lot of us know that in Singapore, the most prevalent faith is not Christianity, but Taoism. And we use the word Taoism, we are actually referring to a mixture of all kinds of teachings. Not pure Taoism, but a lot of local faith. So as you travel along, as you drive along and you're on a bus, you pass by all kinds of temples. I would like you to know that each, almost each and every single temple has its own theology, its own idea of what life is all about. And if you ask the temple medium of temple A, what happened when you die? He gives you a story that is different from temple B, it's different from temple C, temple D. Then you say, hey, I thought all of you are Buddhist Taoists. Not so simple. There are all sorts of influences that come together. And even the Buddhists themselves have so many schools of thought that it's not very easy to segregate. However, a lot of them has this huge commonality in the concept of the samsara or the sixth realm. In Chinese, it's liu tao sun hui. And this is the basis commonality of Taoist, Buddhist, Hindu kind of understanding that's propagated in many different forms. But as you look at it, it sort of go back to the kind of a commonality. Now, this picture is called a Tanka. A Tanka is a Tibetan Buddhist painting, usually on silk. And culturally, it's a beautiful expression. So as I started mentioning as Reformed Evangelical, we look at this from a cultural angle and we appreciate the beauty of it. Uh, Dr. Stephen Tong's museum has a couple of these type of things, uh, including Tibetan Buddhist statue. So some people visited it got very angry and went on the website and write, hey, you know, this church has Buddhist statue inside their museum. This is terrible. And some of the Buddhist statue has Tibetan tantric Buddhism involved. You go back and find out what tantric Buddhism is. You, a lot of people cannot see it. So when they go to his museum, they just walked by. They didn't spot it. I spotted it. I looked at it. I went to ask Dr. Tong. I said, what, you're very daring. Huh? You put tantric Buddhist statue inside there. Go back and find out. You know why it's a very daring thing for him to do. But from a cultural angle, it's fascinating to see how the humankind look at life and, and think and imagine. So in this picture, the big red head is this Lord Yama, which is the Lord of Death. So Lord Yama is holding on to this big round thing and the wheel of life and he's spinning the wheel of life. And the wheel of life consists of six different realms. So this is a Hindu concept that permeates itself into Buddhism. And so practically all Buddhists believe in the sixth realm, the sixth Liu Tao Lung Hui kind of a concept in many different variations. Now, when in application, as I said, Temple A may say this, Temple B may say that, but generally speaking, it's the same. So what does the six realm mean? In samsara understanding, life consists of six different realms. One is the realm of the gods, Tian Tao. The second is the realm of the human, Ren Tao, followed by the realm of the demon or the Asura, Asiu Luo Tao. The realm of the hungry ghost, E Gui Dao. The realm of the animal, Chu Shen Dao. And finally, the realm of health, or Di Yu Dao. So in that circle, in the middle, there are many different depictions. So far, each of the depiction is seen in this arrow. Now, of course, it's very small. You can't quite see it. Now, so most Chinese-based religion believe that life is about this six realm. So obviously, all of you are in what realm? Human, la, of course. Come on, excuse me. I haven't wake up all you. Human realm, right? You're all human beings. So you are all happen to be living in this realm. Those of you have pets, uh, cats and dogs, and all that, fish, uh, tortoise, uh, gup guppies or whatever, they are in the animal kind of realm. So everything in the whole universe belongs to these six different realms. The highest of the realm would be the God realm. So I sort of enlarge this a little bit. It's very, very detailed, you know. And the tanka can be very big. It can be as large as a hill. So in Tibet, sometimes they have a ceremony where they unroll the 
the tanka is as large as your heel, you know. They, they take forever to draw or can be very, very tiny at the same time. So it's a fantastic, intricate kind of thing. So the God's Realm is a realm whereby you try to finally reach. And the God's Realm itself is subdivided into six different realms altogether. And I won't go into the details. So the idea, of course, is for you to reach God's Realm and to be in Nevada where you finally reach in Chinese is Nie Pan, where you finally reach the God realm and then uh, enjoy whatever in heaven. So you have all these clouds and heavenly realm. But at the same time, there's the Asura realm, which is the second realm where it is considered a realm of the demons. Uh, so in the depiction, like, you can't quite see, but these are whole demons that are trying to fight the people in the God's realm. One guy trying to chop down the tree where the gods are at. So there's a lot of fighting. So the Asura realm belongs to demons who come into your life to disturb you as well. So the Asuras will fight the divine and also the human being. So all your diseases and difficulty in your life come from beings that are in the Asura realm. And then, of course, the human realm, very simple. They plant uh, farming at the bottom, have family life, go to the temple to worship and to, to pray. This is a human realm that we all... Uh, live, supposedly living in. Next one, quite interesting, the hungry ghost realm. So, hungry ghosts belong to beings which have obsessive devotion to something. And so, they cannot let go. So, you, you are so obsessed with something, you cannot let go. When you die, you become a hungry ghost, a kui tao, and you enter into a hungry ghost situation and you in the hungry ghost situation you are always hungry lah, basically because you are desiring all sorts of things this is the reason why there's a hungry ghost man in Singapore when you go and look at the hungry ghost man uh, and you ask them what is this all about they may not be able to tell you it got to do with the samsara because they're all confused now, right? Uh, as I mentioned to you last week in Cambodia, they pray to the Tuape Kong and the Tuape Ma. Actually, I, I block it off. And what do they burn to them? They burn US dollar. Replica, la, not the real one. They went to print a lot of US dollar. They burn US dollar. This is fascinating. Because in Cambodia, the Cambodia real, which is their local currency, is useless. So they actually trade in US dollar. So in their understanding, then maybe gods use US dollars as well. So you burn US dollars. So the variation is, is, is very complicated. But the basic understanding comes from the idea of the hungry ghost uh, samsura situation. Now then why do you then feed the hungry ghost during the hungry ghost month? Because if you don't, then they come and disturb you kind of a thing. A hungry ghost month has many, many customs, you know. One of which our congregation follow. You know which one? The first row empty. Yeah, that's the. <laughs> our, our congregation follow that quite religiously. Yeah. First row empty. That's a hungry ghost man custom. <laughs> then the realm of the animal. So, all kinds of animal, big and small. The question is whether a plant is an animal or so. In Buddhist understanding, a, some Buddhist school of thought believe that plants are life. So long as it's alive, it has some form of life inside. Therefore, plant can be considered part of the animal realm as well. You see, the, the thinking process is not very complicated, uh, not very comprehensive. Uh, so a lot of loopholes all over the place. Uh, but that's the general idea. And of course, the most favorite of most people is the hell realm. Even in the, in the Tanka, it has the biggest page because wow, you can draw a lot of things about hell. So the idea of the Samara is that all of us are in this sixth realm. When you die, depending on what you do in this life, you go to one of the six, you know. So if you are a very good person, uh, which realm you go to? God's realm. Oh, I was wrong. If, so if you, are very, if you are a woman and you are very good and do all good in this lifetime, in your next life you become a what? Yeah, you become a man. Uh, sorry to all the women. <laughs> so, but you are a good. <laughs> so, the woman, uh, <laughs> I didn't invent this. Okay. <laughs> so, if you are a good man and you live a really good life, the next realm you can go into God's realm quite immediately. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you try to be funny. You do all kind of nonsense. Like for example, you're a butcher. You go and keep killing pigs. Then, in your next life, you go into the animal realm. Uh, and wherever you go. So, 
it all depends on your merit. So a very simple system. Uh, and you can move in the realm depending on your merit. So if you are pig and you are very good pig, and then you next realm possible for you to move into the human realm. So you are up and down, round, circle, 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 all you go. So you keep moving. The only time you get out of the sama, samsara system is when you reach Nevada, when you become a... Uh, God reach the God's realm, and again there are six different categories from Bodhisattva and all, all kinds of. You finally, reach enlightenment, you become Buddha like. So, in Buddhist concept, there is no God, but together with Hinduism, then the, the whole thing get confused altogether. But in pure Buddhism, there is no God, there is also no soul, so to speak, there's only the self. And the idea is that you need to get rid of the self and any inclination to the self. Finally, you reach enlightenment. In Chinese, it's called Wu Wo, which means that there is nothing, nothing of the nothing of the nothing. It is about nothing, kind of nothingness. And you reach that stage, you are at the higher stage where you have no more kind of uh, thing that, that guides you. So of all the most horrible realm is the realm of hell. And so in common understanding, the samsara then influence all Chinese understanding and the Taoist local faith or that just mix the whole thing together. If you were to ask a Taoist what happened to you when you die, all of them have different stories. For example, when you die, you go on a Huang Qian Lu, you go on a road, then there's a bridge where there's old woman will be there and then she'll ask you to drink a, 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 a soup. And when you read, drink the soup, you'll forget about your past life. So how come? So therefore, that explains why some people seem to think that they remember their past life because they pretend to drink the soup but didn't drink it. Yeah, then they sort of reincarnate to the next life. So they remember that. Hey, last time I used to stay at Yoju Gang or something like that. <laughs> I used to know this young thing, main guy. <laughs> so that's just an idea all keep moving here and there. But of course, the whole idea about the hell is to punish bad people. In Singapore, there used to be a tradition during Chinese New Year, we bring our children to Hopa Villa. Because Hopa Villa is a place where you have horrifying cement uh, statue with 18... Uh, level of hell. Then you bring your kid to the place where you are disrespectful to your parents. Uh, talk back to your parents, you get your tang yen kao. Then they have this thing, yen kao, the tang cut and all that. And then you scare the kid during Chinese New Year, then they will be very filial. But these days, things have changed. La. I found this picture in the, in the internet. <laughs> the girl was brought there and then the horrifying one, wow, this guy is being grounded, the other guy being sore. She's like, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, look at the face. <laughs> that doesn't quite work anymore. But, that's the whole idea of the samsara. One other interesting thing about the samsara is that when you die, you enter into a stage whereby you are like a spirit sort of floating around. Not ghost yet, uh, you're just a spirit floating around. And under Buddhist teaching, that stage stays for how many days? Who knows? Multiple of seven. <laughs> you got it wrong. Multiple of seven. 49 days, 7, 7, 49. So you, when you die, you enter into a stage of sort of like floating around for 49 days before you enter into the samsara wheel of, I want to say wheel of fortune, <laughs> wheel of life, <laughs> you know, where you, where you get assigned. Within the 49 days, if your family is rich or if somebody is very kind, you can summon together the priests and the monks and all that to chant for you and to pray for you so that within the 49 days, your fortune and your merit can change. This is called Chao Tu, where you can expedite the sins of the dead. So therefore, assuming that you are supposed to be a pig in the next life because you kill a lot of pigs in this lifetime, within the 49 days, you spend a lot of money, get a lot of people to chant for you. From the pig, you can be elevated to become a woman or something like that. The next, so I'm, not to men, I'm not saying that woman is the same pig. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can sort of like elevate yourself. However, if you hit the 50th day, then too bad, no? You, you become a pig, but still the people can chant for you. Then when they chant for you, then you become a better pig. Or you have a pig in a better life. Then instead of... You know, we are Chinese New Year, right? Just the other day. So... My mother, uh, my brother went to order a, a, a roast piglet, no? 
Then my daughter called it babe, no, my goodness, that's terrible. <laughs> Rose picker. So instead of being babe, you can be the babe, the pet, pet, pig kind of thing. Yeah. So instead of the pig on the table, because people chant for you, you can be the pet pig. La. Then live a nice pig life until you die, but you still be a pig. La. So so you see the marriage system very, very deeply entrenched in life. Now I'm sharing this with you because I want you to know that around us, many of our friends, many of the people we know in the Chinese society are influenced by this in one way or the other. And it's a very important thing because it tells us that no matter who you are, the idea that there's life after life is instinctive in us. But because they are not guided by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of God, the idea is all over the place and has very little reasoning involved. Out of the six realms, three are negative realms. Hell, Asura, and the hungry ghost. And the other three are the one God, one animal, and one human. And the reasoning process is, is just completely, the logic is, is, is very flawed in our opinion. However, it influences life very, very much so. And people talk about it in one way or the other. When we look at the Bible then, our understanding of life after life is quite radically different. I'm going to summarize some of it in charts for you so that you can understand what it's all about. Now, in our understanding, life is not cyclical. In a biblical understanding, time is linear, meaning it's a straight line. Ain't going to come back. So it's not like you have a next life to come back where you can recycle yourself forward. And therefore, our concept of sin and all that is a linear concept. That if you commit sin, the payback is not in your next life or whatever it is. You have to deal with it right here and now because time is linear. And of course, there's an alpha point at the beginning of time, omega point at the end of time. And within this time space of the all of history, we occupy in the middle where you are born, right here, beginning of your life, and at a certain stage of your life, you will die. And then within the whole span of humanity, you occupy a very brief history of time. A couple of days ago, one of my favorite actors died, John Hurt. Wonderful, wonderful actor. 77, pancreatic cancer. One of John Hurt's quotation is that we are only here for a short period of time. We occupy the chair only for a while. So the chair of life, everybody sit on a chair. It's like you play musical chair before, you know, musical chair. You only occupy it for a short period of time. And he's right, of course. So in the brief history of time, that's where we are. In the context of the world with Jesus Christ, again, we are here, brief history of time. Right be way before us, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ was born here. Our Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died. And our Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected and ascended, right? Way before our brief history of our time. And after we die, and can be possibly before we die also, Jesus Christ will come and we will be resurrected. It is possible that Christ will come before we die, you know, of course. But assuming he doesn't, this is what will happen. So he will die and then all that. And you even project it further up. Brief history of time is here in the eternal decree of God. What exactly will happen when we die? In Christian understanding, when we die, immediately we will be with God. Our soul will be with God. How do we know this? We know this from various parts of the Bible, especially when Jesus Christ tells the guy who was hanging beside him, the robber who was hanging beside Jesus Christ, all he did was ask Jesus, when you should come in your kingdom, remember me. And he became the first person to enter paradise under the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that in itself has many, many lessons, right? One of the lessons is don't be judgmental. Don't think that you're a big deal, you know, that God like you because you are such a nice guy. Because the first person to enter the kingdom of God was a robber, terrible robber, who was not theologically trained, who no know anything, not baptized, never go to catechism class, nothing. All he did was profess faith in Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus say to him? Truly, I say to you, today you will be in paradise with me. So when we die, the first thing that happens is that you will be with God. 
every one of you who really put your faith in Jesus Christ and believe God raised him from the dead, you will be God immediately. The great theologian Dallas Willard passed away last year. Dallas Willard proposed that when Christians die, they won't know that they are dead. I thought it was quite a fascinating idea. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but that's his proposal. Because he believed that the Christian will transit just into another stage where he suddenly finds that he is now in the presence of God. And he won't realize that actually he has passed through. I thought it's a very interesting thought. But your soul will immediately be with God. Your body stays. That's a Christian understanding. And, and, and you are in paradise immediately. You're not in heaven, you're in paradise. Dr. Tong said paradise is the waiting room of heaven. And you will wait until the stage where Jesus Christ returns. And when Jesus Christ returns, your soul and your body will join back together with the resurrection of your body. And that's the Christian understanding of what happens. And in this particular case, the body is considered important. So compared to the samsara concept, the body is meaningless, useless, both up, you don't care. It's about the spirit floating in there. The Christian and the biblical understanding is that the body has a role. The resurrection of the body is important. For this will happen, the body will join back with the soul. This is the reason why some very conservative Christian churches do not believe in cremation. Because if you cremate according to their understanding, then God has problem finding your body. Yeah, when the resurrection happened, what happened? What is it good? And it's quite serious, you know. Uh, I studied under Dr. Quek Sui Hua, Biblical Graduate School of Theology. Other than Dr. Stephen Tong, Dr. Quek is the other person that I have a huge respect for. And he also one of those people who worked very hard for the Lord till now. Uh, we were doing Greek in the seminary. Monday night, I remember. And it's very tough doing Greek with Dr. Quack. And for those of you who are interested in seminary study, let me advise you, always do Greek last. Don't do it first. Because if you do it first, you give up. And you say, oh, this is difficult. I don't want to study anymore. But if you do it last, uh, it's the last course you have to do to graduate. You will do your best to pass. Right? So do it last. Very tough because Dr. Quack is the Singapore's number one authority in Greek. I once translated for him and noticed that he used the Greek Bible. Meaning his Bible is in Greek, okay, hello, you know. It's like, how, how does that work? Uh? For me, it's like, uh, <laughs> you're preaching for Greek Bible. So, attending his Greek class is tough because he will make you stand out. He will say, Sunny, okay, take me, stand up. Then he, then, huh, what? <laughs> Very embarrassing. So, we were waiting for him 7.30 and he didn't come. So, we were quite happy. Maybe he got cancelled or something like that. Uh, because he went to Tringano to, to preach drove up there so he had to drive back right so we thought maybe he got stuck at customs so very happy he didn't appear lo and behold 740 he appeared rushed in then started his lesson and said ah yeah he's here again but in the middle of nowhere somebody came in and said Dr. Quake you have to take a call so there was a phone like outside the the the, the classroom and he went to take a call and so we were all very relieved oh I hang up please stop for a long time and he spoke for a long time and I was very close before I could hear him. Now, what happened is that he is the advisor to the hiding place, helping hand. I always get them confused. Helping hand, which is a drug rehab center at Serangoon Road. One of the residents with drug addict hung himself, uh, committed suicide in the hiding place. So he was talking to him. And I heard him say that, go tell the father that we insist in long barrier. Uh, if he cannot afford a piece of land, I will pay for it. So insist in long barrier. Long barrier means soil barrier because Dr. Kwe Siwa is from Bible Presbyterian Church. So they believe so strongly that when you die, you cannot be cremated. You must be buried. Uh, and one of the reasons is because of, of this. If we cremate you, especially some of you are cremated, not enough. Go and sprinkle all over the place. Right? It's like, uh, make sure that you don't come back again. Well, sprinkle one over this side of the island, the other side over to the sea or whatever it is. You know, bye bye, Paul. You know, <laughs> there you go. Then when God comes, how are they all over the place? But of course, for us, we believe God in His ultimate power can do anything, isn't it? Uh, even if you long barrier in due time, you will dissolve together with all the nature. You know, so it's not a problem for us. But you see, then the importance of the body here. So in Christian understanding, the body is important. And this, then, after you are resurrected, we then 
go to meet Jesus Christ. And as we have seen in the anthem, what a glorious day that will be. Remember that when Christians meet Jesus Christ, it's not a time of fear because it's not a time of judgment. It is a time to meet Christ for the judgment of rewards, what you have done in life. Now, what exactly does that mean is another thing altogether. Very hard to, to say. What does it mean? Because when we are in paradise, as you read in your second responsive reading, Revelation 21, it's such a marvelous description of what life will be like. What does it matter about reward? That's something I don't quite understand. Well, Stephen Tong has a much larger house than I do in heaven. Don't know. <laughs> no, maybe I become his servant or something, something like that. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's very hard to understand. But then it's going to be marvelous. And that's the Christian understanding. And so the Apostle Paul then went on to say what it is like. So people then ask, resurrection, what does it mean? How will we be like? So remember this chart. When you die, the moment you die, you will be in paradise. And so have no fear. This I am absolutely convinced with. The body remains for the time where the resurrection will occur. This is why it influences the way we do our funeral as well. We honor the body. We don't just throw it away or just do whatever we can. There is a sense of honor. However, we also recognize that the person is no longer there. So sometimes we get all confused, right? People cry over the body or whatever it is. So we must have the correct understanding of the truth of God in this matter. Lest, as the Apostle Paul says, we behave like people who have no hope because that's not our lot. Of course, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, when we part from each other, it's going to be very painful and difficult. But remember, we are not people with no hope. I'm going to quickly go through the rest of the verses. Then people ask, what does it mean when I'm resurrected? Especially women. Question and answer. Always ask this question. Stephen Tong always get very upset. When I look 18 years old when I die, I feel women. Eating is a new you know, Always women ask that question. When I resurrected, can I look 18 years old? The Apostle Paul says this. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Yeah, Can I look as if my wrinkles are gone and what have you? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it first die. First affirmation, the resurrected body is not the same as this body you have. And Paul then went on to explain a little bit further. What you saw now is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some grain, like a grain that died first, and then new life will come. But if God gives it a body as he has chosen, to each kind of seed its own body. So he explained first of all that after you are resurrected, your body is not the same with this body. Uh, because not all flesh are the same. But there is one kind for human, another kind for animal, a kind for bird, another kind for fish, another kind for stars, another kind for uh, the sun, the glory of heaven. Of, of the earthly is another. There's one glory for the sun, another glory of the moon. So Paul meant ultimately that your body after resurrection is very different. So what differences are there? The Bible is not explicit on this and hints on it as only. Verse 42, some of the hint is this. So it is with the resurrection of the day. What is so is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. So other than that, Resurrected body is different from our body. The resurrected body is imperishable. That means it will not decay. It will not spoil. It is eternal. And verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now, I want to emphasize one point. The Christian concept of the body is a positive one. We do not believe as other faith does, that the body is a hindrance, the body is a, a, a trap, the body is something that you should just throw away. We don't. As you have seen in the chart, it is important. It, is, it has an important role in the resurrection as well. And remember the Bible says in the earlier chapter that we have studied, that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So first of all, all of you need to know that you must take care of your body. Now, this is Chinese New Year, right? I know you eat like crazy or whatever. In medieval time, gluttony is considered a cardinal sin. Gluttony, uh, eat like a pig. Uh. 
That means you just eat whatever you want. It's considered a big sin, you know, because you don't take care of the body that God has given to you. And it's important for you to do that. I am reaching a stage where I'm, the body has funny aches here and there. I continue to be quite amazed at the fact that if we take care of our body, apart from catastrophic illnesses, it should last for a long time, I think. <laughs> About last month, I read that in uh, England, somebody just broke the world record for marathon running. And you know, I run the marathon. Guy ran the marathon in sub four hours, which is something I will never ever reach in my lifetime. Guess what? He's 85 years old. 85 years old, he ran a sub four. Three hours, 54 minutes. Don't know whether he cheated or not. <laughs> is it possible? <laughs> I don't think I can even run, run a sub five. Sub four is very fast, you know. But at least somebody did it. Okay, like his Angmo also different. Maybe Angmo stronger. <laughs> and inauguration of Donald Trump, one of the most famous volunteer of Habitat for Humanity, I had honor over with Jimmy Carter appear. 93. Guy just survived stage four cancer. You know, and he appeared and was fit like nobody's business, just walk. And we are planning Jimmy Carter work project this year, you know. So... I think we have to be very careful. We have to honor our body and to take care of it because the Bible says it's the temple of the Holy Spirit and it's not to be discarded. But of course, no matter how you honor your body, because we are fallen, sooner or later, it will start to crumble. So it is sown in dishonor, but in resurrection, it's in glory. So it's glorious. Now, for those of you who are aching to find out whether you can look like 18 years old, there is a hint here. Because it's glorious, most likely, yes. <laughs> or at least it's going to be not, not the, 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 the most ugly part of your life. No, it is the most glorious part of your life. So I think it must be beyond the kind of beauty that you hope it to be. It's a glorious, wonderful kind of an existence. So I think it is even beyond yourself when you most look most beautiful. And also the resurrected body is raised in power, no longer in sickness, no longer in weakness, but in power. And verse 44 says, It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there's a spiritual body, there's also a, a natural body, is also a spiritual body. Resurrected body is raised a spiritual body. That means it's pure spirit, as, as you've seen, it's combination of the spirit and the body, but it's, it's in a new form that is more spiritual, that definitely not like the present physical constraint kind of a body, but a different kind of spiritual body. And then he concludes with the subsequent verses. Again, reiterating in verse 45, first man Adam became a living being, last Adam became life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. This is the way we live our life, the physical first, then after that, that new being. First man was from the earth, man of dust, second is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. But as the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the spirit of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And that concludes our focus passage. The last few verses are encouraging and it points out the difference between us and everybody else. If you do not believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you belong to verse 48. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. But if you do, then this verse comes strongly. We shall also bear the image of the man in heaven. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, as preached last week, is not just about Jesus Christ. It's about all of us. For he is the first fruit. And we are are a followers of the first food and we will be resurrected too. I think of all the imagery that God has given to us to understand this great mystery, the metamorphosis of the butterfly is the best example of them all. If you have ever watched this in a butterfly farm or whatever, it's the most marvelous and miraculous thing to see. Where the caterpillar, ugly, dead, went into a pupa stage. And all of a sudden, the most beautiful transformation happened right before your very eyes as the butterfly emerged. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the promise of the Bible, the reality of life for all of us 
who proclaim Jesus as Lord. May we understand this and may we affirm this. And the more we understand this, the more we are able to set our priorities right in our present lifetime. So that the things that will make us happy, the things that will make us sad, will all change. And it will all change in accordance to the word of God and the truth of God. May God bless us this morning as we meditate upon his word. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the continual lesson on the resurrection. We have to admit that for many of us, this is perhaps the furthest thing away from our mind. We are crowded with a lot of cares of the world, a lot of worries, a lot of issues, and we somehow would not think very deeply into any of these things. Yet it is your truth found in your word of eternal life. We pray, O God, that you will open up our eyes, that we will read your word and meditate upon it so that we get our priorities right in life, that we may not worry about so many things that are really inconsequential finally, that we put our priorities right in life and proclaim you indeed as Lord of our life and be thankful that we have been called by you. Help us to understand the reality of our life after life, that life doesn't stop when we stop breathing, but by your grace and your great mercy, we have been called into you and that we will be resurrected like all who believe in you, and as the Bible we have read tell us, enter into eternal bliss because of what your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. Help us to come to an even better understanding of this. In this day, the second day of the Chinese New Year, help us to be filled with thanksgiving for all that you have given to us. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.